Open your cerebral cortex and shift your lobes into upper beta phase because you are going to have Bitcoin knowledge transmitted directly into your vestibulocochlear. Your host at Bitcoin Knowledge is Trace Mayer, an early Bitcoin advocate since it cost a quarter, but this is not intended to be investment advice. A doctor of jurisprudence, but this is definitely not legal advice. And an investor in core cryptocurrency infrastructure, including Armory, BitPay, Kraken, and Mitagio, but this is not a recommendation of those services. Here, you get fed via direct mind download with pure and free Bitcoin knowledge. So before we get straight into the interview, uh, just a quick disclaimer. I actually hadn't used Bread Wallet before. There are tons of wallets out there. I just hadn't had time to. And I uh, actually, after the interview, downloaded a copy of it, uh, began to use it, and I really like it. It's super simple. It's probably going to replace my blockchain.info. You know, Nick Carey, CEO of blockchain.info, is in our next interview. Uh, I love that wallet, too. It's just they have different uses and functions. One thing I don't necessarily like about Bread Wallet, there's no uh, coin control, but I can take care of that on blockchain.info or Armory. So, anyways, on to the interview. Welcome back to the Bitcoin Knowledge Podcast. We have Aaron Voisin, founder and CEO of Bread Wallet. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Trace. So... Bread Wallet's the first hierarchical deterministic SPV wallet. Yeah. Right? Can you um, can you explain a little bit to our audience like what does that even mean? It's all like dolphin speak to me. All right. Yeah, so we had the first one to have that by Bitcoin J, which is a Java Bitcoin wallet. They have it now too as well. But uh, we had it first. So um, what uh, hierarchical deterministic means is that all your Bitcoin addresses are generated from a single seed value. So if you just back up that one seed value, you can encode it in an English phrase, like 12 words, and then you can generate all your Bitcoin addresses from that one phrase, and you get to use a new Bitcoin address for every single transaction, which helps protect your privacy. And that that's important because you're able to do a backup once, mm-hmm. and you'll be able to restore from that no matter how many addresses you used. In the earlier Bitcoin implementation, it only backed up 100 keys at a time, which you could go through pretty quickly considering change and all of that stuff. Now, in the and then uh, SPV means that uh, uh, actually it connects to the Bitcoin network directly instead of uh, trusting a server. So, yeah, it connects and downloads a filtered version of the blockchain. Obviously, you can't put the whole blockchain on your phone, but you get a filtered version of the blockchain, and then you can prove that the Bitcoin network believes that a particular transaction is valid from a filtered version of the blockchain. Yeah, because I think it's section 7 of the white paper mm-hmm. where it talks about these SPV What's that acronym even stand it for? It stands for Simplified Payment Verification. Okay, so SPV is Simplified Payment Verification. Yes. And that's a way that we can, what, check the balances of our addresses without using quite as much exactly. of the resources or the whole blockchain? Correct. So what you can do is, um, instead of having the whole blockchain, um, you just get a filtered version that includes all the transactions for your addresses plus a bunch of extra ones so that the node that you're connecting to doesn't know exactly which ones are yours. So it's not great privacy, but it's better than nothing, and you can improve that by connecting through Tor and other things that are that are coming up. Oh, um, oh really? Like yeah. Tor integration right into the bread wall? Correct. So then that's not added yet, but that's something that I want to add so that even the nodes that you connect to on the Bitcoin network don't know your IP address or where you're coming Don't from. know the addresses you're checking balances for. Exactly. Like, oh, someone just checked this balance for the 18th time from this IP address in Las Vegas and that address has 10,000 Bitcoins in it. Like, Correct. let's figure out who this person is. Yep, yep. <laughs> Now, when we're looking at these SPV, we've done another interview with Adam Woodwin from Chain.com. And okay. Chain's building an API to interact with the Bitcoin network. How does something like this Chain API differ from this SPV implementation? Do you help some of our people kind of understand the technical guts of that? Right. If you have a wallet that doesn't connect to the Bitcoin network but uses one of these APIs, you're relying on those APIs to give you accurate data. Those servers could get hacked or they could go down. Or just Um, provide fake data. Or provide fake data if it was a a malicious operator. Hopefully they're not malicious. Or they've been (laughs) compromised. Exactly, yeah, if they get hacked. 
this actually does cryptographic verification of the data coming off the Bitcoin network just like a full node would. It can't verify the entire chain of transactions all the way back to when the coins in question were created because it doesn't have the whole blockchain. But it can prove that this transaction was included in this block and that this block is included in the longest chain. Okay, so you're going with the most recent transaction for a particular address and uh, looking at the inputs? It, it does actually get all the transactions oh, all for, for all the addresses in your wallet, just not all addresses in all of Bitcoin. Okay. So. Does that slow down the wallet at all? I mean, because we're dealing with so much data, or is it still a very fast process for the end user? It's very quick. When you launch the app and start a new wallet, it doesn't have to look back very far because it knows that you just created the wallet, so you're not going to have to search a large part of the chain to find all the transactions. So it just gets to the very end of the blockchain, and it syncs in a few seconds when you start a new wallet. Now, if you restore a wallet from backup, and that backup is fairly old, like let's say a year or two old, it can take a couple of minutes, but it's much faster than downloading the whole blockchain. It can do it in a few minutes. So Okay, reasonable. so let me see if I understand this correctly. If you create a new wallet, it doesn't necessarily go and download very much of the blockchain Right, it at just all. grabs like the last block. 2,000 blocks or something. But if you're restoring from a backup, then it might go and get like the last... 20,000 blocks or 200,000 blocks. Yeah, or from whenever the wallet was created, it has to start from that point and then scan the blockchain from that point going forward. How would it know when the wallet's created if you're restoring it from a backup? If you're just using like these 12 phrases that are the seed from the hierarchical deterministic format. It would do that like let's say if you deleted the app and reinstalled it and then it still has the creation date stored. If you're restoring it on a new device, it actually does have to go back to when the uh, backup phrase format was created. Is the Bread Wallet format interoperable with any of our other wallets out there, like Electrum or Blockchain.info or Armory? And are we able to restore from seeds that are from those particular types of wallets? I've heard that uh, Hive is using the same structure as far as the hierarchical deterministic structure as uh, Bread Wallet is using. I haven't actually tried it myself, but I've been told that you can use your Bread Wallet backup phrase in Hive and it'll work as well. I actually co-authored uh, BIP39 with the guys working on Trezor. BIP39 is the uh, backup phrase format that a lot of the new wallets are using. Okay, so just so the audience kind of understands, BIP means Bitcoin Im- Improvement Proposal. 39 would be like we have 32 or 33 or 34. We have 39, and that's on phrase backups? Yeah, this is a mnemonic, we call a mnemonic for uh, encoding your, your wallet seed uh, in 12 English words. And that can actually then be converted into other formats, right? Like base 58 or base hex or, right? Yeah, yeah. This is really interesting. Can you perhaps explain a little bit how this BIP 39 actually works? So there's... Because we're turning words into a number, which we then send through an algorithm that generates a bunch of our addresses, right? Right. So how does this bunch of words get turned into this number? So there's 2,048 words. So each word represents 11 bits of data. If you have uh, 12 words, you end up with 132 bits. Take the number that word is in the word list, and then that's part of the number for this seed phrase, which is binary string. Okay, so we're looking at generating entropy, yes. which is the randomness. Right, and the word the uh, might be like apple, and that then corresponds with a particular number. Correct, yeah. So really, like, even though it's a whole word like apple, it's really just a variable, like A, B, C, D, or whatever. Exactly. Right? Okay. And then it's using some fancy elliptic curve math to go from that seed to generate uh, new addresses. Uh, So you can generate a chain of addresses from a seed, and it can be as many as you need. Is this use of the elliptic curve, do you think that was done intentionally by Satoshi? The reason he used elliptic curve is just because it's a very compact way of doing digital signatures. So you need to sign your transactions to prove that they're yours. Yeah, because it's elliptical curve digital signature authority, right? Yeah, Exta. ECDSA, yeah. Yeah, ECDSA. Yeah, digital signature algorithm, right? Yeah. So, yeah, it's... Uh... I'm sorry, it's been a long day. I'm tired. <laughs> yeah, it's Vegas. <laughs> yeah, it's Vegas. 
The reason that he chose that is because it's very compact, which you know helps with the blockchain bloat or to avoid blockchain. To bloat. avoid that, keep the transaction sizes small. Exactly, you want them that to be way. As we can have more in a block or whatever. Keep right. the block small. That way, it's already what twenty gigabytes yeah, compressed. It's, it's getting close to thirty gigs. Thirty gigs yeah. now. Good gracious. So. Let's see. So, what's your vision with Breadwall? Like, what are you hoping to accomplish with it? Yeah. So, really, I started the project with the goal of creating a really beautiful simple, intuitive Bitcoin wallet that was safe for anybody to use, people who don't have the first clue about computer security. That's why I went with the iOS platform, the iPhone platform, to start with, because uh, all the devices are hardware encrypted by default. All the apps are sandboxed. That means that none of the other apps can read other apps' data, and it only runs code that's signed by Apple. So it's basically hardened against malware, and it's probably the best protected against malware of the popular computing platforms out there. Right, because uh, I mean, mobile devices are notoriously insecure in a lot of ways. Yeah, I think iOS has a really good security story, and uh, I wanted it to be safe. I think that uh, malware is going to be a huge problem for the whole Bitcoin industry in the next couple of years. Already something like 20 or 30 percent of all the malware out there being discovered today is Bitcoin stealing malware. Really? Everybody's and, trying to steal Bitcoin. And Bitcoin is tiny. Imagine when yeah. Bitcoin is like a major global currency that millions of people are using every day. It's going to be a real problem. So. Yeah, because I mean the data itself is the money. Like, yes. And you, you steal cash. it. Like it is great to it's, steal. It's digital cash. And, yeah. um, you know, it's it's a very lucrative target for hackers. It's way more lucrative than turning people's computers into spam bots or even stealing credit card numbers. So this is going to be a serious problem for the whole industry. And I wanted something that grandma can use. You know, she uses money even though she will click on any email attachment she gets sent. And, you know, her computer's probably infected with all kinds of malware. So she can't use a web wallet because she'll get robbed. How is grandma going to use money if Bitcoin becomes the currency that everybody's using? How do we make it safe and simple enough for regular people to use who don't understand computer security? Right. And, and it's open source. Yes, it's, of course. It's open source source. The source code's on GitHub, except you know, in pull requests. Just, I don't think a lot of people in the audience understand what Git is, and this is fairly off topic, mm -hmm. but can we explain a little bit about what this Git protocol is and how it helps software developers really build very robust code? Uh, yeah, it's called a, a SCM or software control or software. Yeah, version control yeah, system. Yeah, version control system. So it just makes it easy so that when I'm writing code on my computer, I can do what's called a commit, and I push my changes to this repository, and then other people who are working on the project can see my changes, and they can pull my changes down to their computer, and then it'll you know, merge it if we both make changes to the same file. It'll merge the changes, and it's a tool to help a software developers collaborate and work together on the same piece of code without stepping on each other's toes. And that's really the big, big deal, is that you're able to have cooperation without coordination. Yes. Because everybody has access to all of the source code all of the time. One, you can review it mm -hmm. for any security holes. Anybody can. Exactly. But two is that a person in India and a person in the U.S. can make changes independently and yet submit them using the Git protocol and they get merged and you still have one canonical version of the control system of the right. finished version. So, I mean, this is a really, really big deal when it comes to open source code management, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's super handy and even gets more complex than that. Like, let's say, I don't want to merge this person's change because I don't like it, but maybe other people like it so they can do a fork and then there's multiple versions and at any point I can change my mind and merge the changes back in and just a tool to make that doable. And every change is linked mathematically to whoever's making the change. Yeah, it changes uh, it has its like unique. Hash. Yeah, it has its unique hash. You know exactly where the changes are when they're proposed, what those changes are, because there's diff. Like, what's a diff? It's just where you look at the difference between one version and another version. Uh, if you make an edit, then the diff is just the differences, the, the changes that you made. Yeah, so if, like, we have a sentence like, the cat was blue, and then we wanted to change it, and it said the cat was red, then the word blue would now be in yeah. red, and then the other word would be in green, right? And so the red is what's being subtracted, and the green is what's being added. 
This is very important from our security standpoint because the NSA actually got RSA to compromise some of the cryptographic protocols, right? Yep. Could you perhaps go into a little bit of depth on that and how it's important for us to have these diffs so that everybody has access to all the source code all the time and knows exactly what the changes are and when they're made and like how that helps in reviewing the security of these open source wallets out there. If it's open source and you can see all the changes, you know, it makes it easy to review the code and then if somebody adds something, you can just look at the changes that were made so it makes it quicker to review. Um, specifically what the NSA is rumored to have done is there's a random number generator algorithm that uses elliptic curves but not the same curve that Satoshi used, thankfully. But the way that that curve was generated, there was some question as to whether or not it was done in such a way that the NSA could predict what numbers would be generated from the random number generator, which would allow them to compromise uh, the security of you know any encryption that, that used that random number generator. Yeah, so that would be a purely mental attack. I like to distinguish there's physical attacks, like where someone actually steals your phone or computer and are able to compromise the private keys that way. But this would be a purely mental attack where the entropy is being attacked, right? basically. Right. So if somebody were to try and push a change to one of their wallet software, but it's all reviewable, then it'll be much easier to track down whether these types of attacks are attempted or not. Yeah, and for that specific case, there are really two different types of attacks. Like One is attacking the random data that gets generated, so all the wallets need a random seed to start with. And all the code can be great, and you can review it, and it looks good, but if you have a bad random number to generate a wallet from, then you're in trouble. That's a, another security issue um, that I don't think is quite related to uh, reviewing the code itself, yeah, unless but, you could review the code of the random number generator. Yeah, random number generators have been compromised also. Yes, you know, exactly. So sometimes you want to be able to generate your own entropy by rolling dice or with a deck of cards or something of that nature. Just to kind of close off the interview, what's like the thing you're most excited about in the Bitcoin community and what's the thing that you're most concerned about? Well, I'm, uh, I'm really excited about the, the user growth that it seems to uh, you know, be catching on with more and more people. I'm excited about you know, uh, giving people an alternative to fiat currencies uh, in places like Argentina and Zimbabwe uh, where you know, they have horribly mismanaged currencies and uh, giving people a way out to get around capital controls um, you know, to be able to transfer a million dollars to China you know, in seconds for six cents. I think that's just, that's just amazing. Um, so that, that's what excites me most about Bitcoin. That's what gets me up in the morning. And I want to give everybody the ability to participate in that. And that's why I wanted to build a, a really well-designed wallet that was safe so that they could hold on to their own Bitcoins uh, instead of trusting somebody else and do it in a way that's safe and easy for everyone. That's what I, <laughs> that's why I started this project. And yeah. that's, that's why I'm passionate about it. That's awesome. Any concerns you have? Just what I mentioned before, I think the biggest problem we're going to see in the year or two ahead is is Bitcoin stealing malware, I think it's going to become a serious problem and all uh, wallet developers out there, you know, really need to take this problem seriously. Security is going to be a big problem for Bitcoin and tests information security a lot more than anything that's come before by giving such a huge financial incentive to break these systems. We need to really work hard on figuring out how to keep people from getting robbed. Well, I completely agree with that sentiment. The security is the foundation of this entire exactly. uh, industry and ecosystem and you're building those solutions. Where can people find you? In the App Store, if you just search for Bread Wallet. Um, also, you can go to breadwallet.com and you get a link to the source code on GitHub if you're technically minded or get just a, a link to the to download the app and try it. Give it a try. It's super easy and I think people will like it. You can give it to people who who are just learning Bitcoin, and it even gives them like a little tutorial that explains how to use the wallet when you launch it. Well, Bitcoin is actually a currency, and it has an exchange rate that changes. That's why your balance changes sometimes, that kind of thing. So. Oh, wonderful. Well, there we've had it. Aaron Voisin, building solutions to some of the greatest problems in the Bitcoin space, founder and CEO of Bread Wallet. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. Get a copy of the free Bitcoin guide at freebitcoinguide.com. Got a question or suggestion? Record your voice at bitcoin.kn. Don't be shy. To help the show, share bitcoin.kn with friends, post about it on Reddit, and otherwise spam the interwebs. 
your iTunes comments and five-star reviews are very important to us. Please continue tuning in to the Bitcoin Knowledge Podcast, where we release interviews with the top people in the Bitcoin world. Now take some choline and let that Bitcoin knowledge consolidate. Yeah.